And hello, folks. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. And hey, uh, happy Valentine's Day. I hope you have a great day for those that uh, you're connected to in that romantic way. One of the other cases we've been covering, you know, we had a couple of verdicts yesterday, and we'll get to those cases, but there's a live case out of Iowa now. Cedar Rapids is the location, and Jerry Burns is the defendant. This is a, I don't even want to say cold case. It is in the deep freeze and has been for 40 years. Michelle Martinko died on December 19th, 1979. A senior in high school getting ready for the rest of her life not to be found dead in her parents' car at the Westdale Mall on the west side of Cedar Rapids. A 72 Buick, a giant car um, that she had taken to the mall to see about getting a new coat coat was there on layaway. She was going to make a payment or maybe even pick it up. Uh, that didn't happen either. She saw a lot of friends at the mall because I'm telling you back in 1979 hanging out at the mall was the thing to do. Unfortunately it ended with her death in the car at the mall and the key bit of evidence in this case and the reason it has come back from a cold frozen case to hot and heavy now in that courtroom is DNA and we've seen it before not to this degree so much because uh, out in California we had the Golden Gate uh, killer there that was tracked down by familial DNA and it's the same kind of thing going on here. So because I'm not so bright, I have somebody here to help us understand exactly how this works. Terry Rosenblatt is here. She's an attorney. She's with the Legal Aid Society, specifically the DNA unit. Now, Terry, first of all, welcome, but you're supposed to be here. Uh, you know, most people don't travel 3,000 miles to the other coast to get away from me, but you did. I'm glad you're here, though. Can you help me understand this new string, this new discipline? that uh, links the DNA to a suspect? So, it sounds, so there's a lot of different ways that um, DNA can be compared. And what I want to say first is that we should always be careful when there's DNA in the case to not stop thinking. Or DNA is not everything, particularly in modern DNA testing where smaller and smaller amounts of biological material com are compared. It's just not always probative. Sometimes it is, but it's not always probative. So whenever there is a DNA quote unquote match, you always want to say to yourself, well, what other evidence is there? How strong is this association? Really, are there other innocent explanations? We shouldn't let DNA alone take off sort of our usual, as you said, with, with, um, with the Weinstein case, our usual common sense about whether something makes sense or not. Well, now, as far as, go ahead. Let's go into the, let's go into some of that detail because you know this thing happens in '79. They do the normal investigation DNA really in its infancy then, mm -hmm. um, and, and so as things move along and move forward, mm -hmm. what triggers some sort of reevaluation and the use of this uh, this familial DNA? Well, I think that law enforcement has discovered a new they would say tool I might say toy but a new thing that they can try to use to quote unquote solve old crimes um, and so familial DNA is a combination of techniques it involves taking genetic material and doing a different kind of testing on it a test that looks for essentially ancestry the same thing that's happening when you do um, ancestry.com or or GED match and those kinds of tests are then combined with people who comb through records and build out family trees. Um, and then once that family tree is built, just like it would be on your Ancestry app, law enforcement might go and try to track people down. Now, where this becomes problematic, right, is what is law enforcement doing when they're going through those steps? How many people are they going to and taking DNA from who they know aren't even really suspects, but are just people who they're trying to use to build out that family tree. And what about those people's rights and what happens to their DNA after it's taken? So I think familial searching is a really problematic kind of law enforcement technique and one that we should think really critically about. Yeah, and that was my first thought because we have, uh, you know, we have ensconced DNA as the end-all, be-all. That if you've got DNA, uh, forget it, Mr. Defendant, you're doomed. And I think there's the risk of putting that sort of uh, heightened uh, belief in this new familial DNA, and maybe it's premature to do that. What do you think? I think that's absolutely right. I think that the, the Golden State case got so much attention, and... Obviously, once that happens, 
there's a there's a totally natural and normal desire to say, well, we should solve more crime. But that shouldn't overtake the idea that we should be mindful and careful and really concerned about the idea that first of all, we might get the wrong person um, or we might just scoop up people who really had nothing to do with this along the way. And those people have rights. And what about this, you know, the whole privacy concept? I know that uh, 23andMe and uh, Ancestry.com, I mean, these folks are becoming this uh, composite, this repository, this compendium of tons of valuable <laughs> DNA. But who owns that? Should the cops get a look at that? But should the cops get a look at that? And do people, when they submit to 23andMe, are they really thinking, you know, I'm not only finding out, you know, if I am like have Irish descent or if I have a predisposition for a disease, but I'm also giving over information for my whole family, my family that exists now and my future generations, right? The children or grandchildren or grandnieces or nephews who haven't even come into existence yet. I'm now turning over their genetic information to a private company that law enforcement, first of all, has access to. And you know, even from the non-law enforcement end, what about other commercial uses of that kind of data? And I think we have a responsibility if, if you're going to make that choice to realize that you're not just making that choice for yourself, you're making that choice for your family too. Yeah, and, and I can see a real abuse, misuse issue here. And let's talk mm -hmm. about just the nature of the DNA real quickly before I let you go here. It is familial DNA. so. What keeps the expert from finding the defendant being the one who has contributed via familial DNA and not one of the other family members? There has to be supportive, corroborative mm -hmm. evidence. You can't just rely on that one source. Right. It sounds like what law enforcement tried to do here is to get a confirmatory sample from that straw. I don't know how strong that is, right? That's going to be an issue that's going to have to be presented at trial, and the jury's going to have to consider that. Where did that straw come from? Was that obtained legally? How closely is it connected to this person who's on trial? And those are all questions that might become part of what's discussed in front of the jury and some of the things the jury might have to consider. Yeah, and in this Burns case, uh the corroborative evidence so far just doesn't seem to be there. There seems to be no real connection. As to the recovery of that straw, as I understand it, and this is sort of a fine point constitutionally, we know that once you throw something in the trash, hey, no reasonable expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment. But this straw was just kind of left on the table where he had used it and then wandered off. I guess that's close enough to the trash that it counts, but I can see gradations of that analysis to the point where, hey, maybe it's not uh, giving up that Fourth Amendment right. That's just yeah. one of the issues. What do you think about that? I would say that close enough is nowhere in the Constitution. We don't do close enough. You haven't seen that phrase in the Constitution? Sort of, kind of close? I've, I've heard some folks try it, and it's not right. Close enough does not get you there. And, and I want to make this point, too, right? When we think about what does it mean for something to be, quote, unquote, abandoned, um, first of all, I have to look at how that thing was actually taken. Was it, was it actually coerced from the police? Did the person really have a choice about what they were doing with that item? And even if you get all the way to they did have a choice and they did abandon, which I think is not, um, that is not a slam dunk in the situation you've described. What about their DNA on the item? Doesn't, that's your, that is a part of your body and your genetic material. And are you really abandoning that? And I, I would say, I don't think so. I think for sure, if the framers of the Constitution could have possibly contemplated this development ever happening, they would say, no way. <laughs> Let me ask you one more thing that directly relates mm -hmm. to the Burns case. You know, there was a cousin that disappeared mm -hmm. on, I think it was the 34th anniversary of Michelle Martenko's death. There's been mm -hmm. no connection of that disappearance to Jerry Burns, the defendant, but it was his cousin. Well, maybe it was the cousin's familial DNA that we found in the car. Possible? Okay. I mean, that really sounds like a question that the jury should be thinking about. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's anything but clear, but at least you've helped me get a little clearer in my muddled mind here, because I'm not sure DNA existed when I went to school. It's been a while. Uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, Terry. Enjoy your uh, holiday. It's a long weekend, and uh, enjoy your time uh, out there on the West Coast. Thanks again. Good to have you on, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Be well. Take care. Okay, so we will be back into the Burns case here in just a couple of moments. They uh, Are they coming back live? Yeah, they're, they're getting busy uh, in the courtroom. We'll take a quick break. We will join them right after this. This is the Long Crime Network.